Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. It is Transformers Day, the network architecture that pretty much dominates the entire industrial and research universe of deep learning models in today's AI climate. And today we are going to discuss why exactly are transformers so powerful and so universally applicable. We are starting today's video by talking about the really critical concept of inductive bias in machine learning. If there is just one thing that I want you to take back from this video, it is understanding why inductive bias is the key to appreciate the power of transformers and attention models in general. So what is inductive bias? Think of it as a guiding light for our deep learning models where we deliberately implant specific rules and limitations into the learning process, moving our neural networks away from generalization and steer it more towards practical solutions that better align with our data's domain. Now, that might sound a little complex, but it is actually pretty simple and let me explain it to you with an example. Let's consider the feedforward or MLP network. Each layer in an MLP makes a nonlinear projection of its previous layer's output and transforms it into a new space. More layers mean more complex nonlinear representations between the input and the output, but they do not make any assumptions about the input's spatial or sequential structure. Compare that to a more specialized architecture like convolutional neural nets or CNNs. CNNs train multiple convolutional filters to detect local patterns like edges and textures. CNNs add a location-specific inductive bias by telling the neural network that nearby pixels are more related to recognizing patterns instead of distant ones. Let's take another example, RNNs, which are designed to sequentially process time series data like texts. RNNs maintain a hidden state vector that gets updated at each time step as new items in the sequence are inputted. Because of this, the hidden state develops a close association with the very recent input time steps compared to the really distant past. RNNs therefore also imposes an inductive bias that recent time steps are more important for the hidden state than past ones. Now let's talk about attention, specifically self-attention. Is self-attention more general or more biased? I'll argue that they are not only more general than CNNs and RNNs, but they are even more general than MLP layers. Why? Let's get into it. The goal of self-attention is to input a collection of independent input embeddings and then contextualize each item with each other to generate a new set of contextual embeddings. Self-attention does not explicitly focus on a neighboring locality like CNNs, and unlike RNNs, it doesn't impose a recency bias. It basically has this global view of the entire sequence and it can access all of the positions simultaneously, basically treating everything with equal importance. But why are self-attention models more general than even NLPs? If you look at these two animations side by side, they might appear somewhat similar because they're both fully connected to the previous layer. But there are some major differences. One, MLPs generally operate on a one-dimensional vector, meaning each element of the input is a single float value that represents one attribute of the input item. Self-attention can also work with one-dimensional inputs like MLPs, but they're also suited to handle multi-dimensional inputs where each individual input can themselves be complex items that are represented as entire vectors. And there is another very subtle difference between the two that most people kind of miss. And I think that is one of the biggest factors in the success of attention in general. We had a little demonstration of this in the previous video. The standard self-attention formulation can be written as a good old WX plus B multiply add operations. Obviously, MLPs apply this multiply add operation in each of its layer, but the weights and biases at each layer does not change according to the input. Self-attention also applies a multiply add operation, but the weights and biases of this projection change with every input depending on their query key value vector. And for this extra layer of adaptability, self-attention is more generalizable and has more representational power than standard MLPs. So before the attention paper came in, the traditionally deep learning research was more focused on introducing inductive biases in the training architectures. CNN used to be the state of the art for image related tasks and LSTMs and GRUs used to be the mainstays for NLP related tasks back in early 2010s. More bias meant that the network could assume patterns about the data, making it easier to learn from smaller training data sets. However, attention broke this trend. They aren't restricted by a leash of assumptions, allowing them to have incredible representational capability. And given enough data, GPU resources, and training time, they can train more general powerful models than those ones with inductive bias. 
And now let's dive into the technical aspects of how a transformer model really operates under the hood. But before that, leave me a like, share it with your friends and ML buddies, subscribe if you haven't, because I'm working on some cool stuff in the next few months for this channel. And I think you guys are going to love all of that. And of course, my last two videos have been about building the intuition behind attention and self-attention straight from first principles. And while you are not required to watch them to understand this one, they do cover critical intuition behind the topics discussed here. I'll leave a link in the description and I promise if you watched all these three videos, you're going to have all the tools you need to not just understand attention and transformers, but enough intuition to explain it to others. Cool? Now let's get back to the video. The original transformer model was trained to do sequence to sequence tasks, for example, language translation, where we convert a sentence from French to English. We have an encoder that inputs the French sentence, computes its embeddings, and then a decoder looks at these encoder embeddings and learns to generate the English translation. The encoder uses multi-headed self-attention to input the tokens of the source sentence. Each token embedding is a combination of two embeddings. The word embedding of the token that embeds the meaning of the word and a positional embedding that embeds the location of the token in the sequence. Adding positional encodings gives each of the token a designated position in the sequence. So the self-attention input becomes the at position 1, cat at position 2, and so on. This combined input then passes through several multi-headed self-attention layers to obtain the final set of embeddings for each token in the sequence. Next, let's talk about the decoder. The decoder inputs all of the encoder's embeddings and also the English sentences prepended by a special token like start, and then outputs the same English sentence but shifted by one token, meaning the corresponding output for start is the, and the corresponding output for the is cat, and so on. The decoder leverages two crucial type of attention. Firstly, causal mask attention, to make sure that the tokens are only allowed to attend towards the past tokens that came before it. The tokens are not allowed to peek into the future, an important property we'll delve deeper into shortly. The second type of attention in the decoder is the encoder-decoder cross-attention, which is perhaps a more easier and intuitive concept to grasp. The query originates from the input token embeddings and it attends to the keys and values coming from the encoder embeddings. This basically marries the world of the encoder French sentences and the decoder English sentence, basically making the English tokens contextually aware of what's going on in the French world. The transformer decoder is a series of causal mask attention followed by encoder decoder attention. It is continuously contextualizing each input token with its past token and then combining this information with the encoder's embeddings. Uh, there are also some other optimizations like layer normalizations, learning rate decay, subword tokenization, and more. Resources I'll link below for those interested in diving deeper into the lower level implementation specifics. If you're familiar how decoder RNNs work in traditional encoder-decoder architectures, they are also trained to generate tokens one by one. What is the advantage of transformers then? Well, there are two main ones, but they're both game changers which made Transformer so powerful that made LSTMs and GRUs and other RNN models kind of obsolete in today's AI climate. Firstly, RNNs tend to face some challenges with long range dependencies. RNNs bottle up all of the past sequence into this one single hidden state embedding, creating an information bottleneck for long sequences to be properly represented in this single vector. On the contrary, self-attention and masked self-attention can globally access any point in the sequence simultaneously without constraining information flow through any bottlenecks. And this mathematical magic allows transformers to learn really long-term dependencies really well. The second advantage is more related to training efficiency and the ease of parallelization. RNNs lack parallelizability due to their sequential nature as each token's computation depends on the updated hidden state from the previous token. This limitation considerably slows down training, especially for extensive documents. However, causal mask attention is parallelizable. They only consists of matrix multiplications of the query key value embeddings and then the softmax operation. All of these operations can individually be vectorized and run really fast on the GPUs. 
In RNNs, the notion of sequence is modeled by literally inputting the tokens in the sequential order, whereas in transformers, the notion of sequence comes from positional encodings. Adding positional encodings to the word embeddings at the start is something that can also be parallelized. To me, grasping this concept of causal masked self-attention might be the trickiest part, but also the linchpin concept for understanding the transformative power of transformers as well as its successors like GPT. Parallel training of a sequence plus ordered dependency plus simultaneously accessing the past tokens. It's just brilliant and thanks to this idea we are now training on billions of tokens at a fraction of time with attention than we did previously with RNNs and LSTMs. Wow, just wow. So a word of caution. Keep in mind that the parallelization in the decoder is only possible during training because we already have the entire target English sentence available from the training dataset. During inference in the decoder, parallel processing is not possible. Instead, we switch to the autoregressive token by token generations that RNNs do. Inferencing with transformers can be sped up with a bunch of other tricks like KV caching, but I think this video is already a lot information heavy, so I'm going to save off transformer inferencing for another day. Uh, there's still a lot to talk about, but I generally believe that if you followed these last three videos, you have all the tools you need to understand transformers and attention from first principles. If you're interested in learning more, check out my history of NLP video where I go over more of these topics, including more derivative work from transformers like BERT, GPT, T5, Excelnets. I'm going to take the leave now, keep those neural networks firing, and don't forget to subscribe because you are magnificent.